I'm really delighted to be chairing today's event. Uh, one of the uh, strategic priorities of the IWA, the Institute of Welsh Affairs, is, is about shaping policies that enable and support high performing, responsible and responsive essential public services in Wales. And that's why I'm particularly interested in the conversation we're about to have. Uh, from a personal perspective too, having sat in the hot seat as a decision maker on the ground, for a couple of international humanitarian organizations while working in conflict zones around the world for a number of years. I'm really interested to hear how decision makers here have influenced this last year, and this extended crisis that we've all been living through, how they're making sense of it and what they and we can all learn from it. And the point of today's conversation obviously is so that we can all be better prepared, act more in concert, save more lives, and improve the quality of our lives for when this happens again, because we know that it will. So I want us to hold that in our heads as we go through uh, this afternoon's uh, discussion. I'm going to introduce you to our speakers and then I'm going to uh, get us stuck straight into it. First of all, we have Ian, Ian Bancroft, who's the Chief Exec of Wrexham County Borough Council. He's had his current role for just under three years. Wrexham's also his home. Um, it, throughout his career, Ian has placed an emphasis on ensuring policy follows through into practice. Um, and in a number of roles, he's led on growing the social sector in an area to try and enable communities to be resilient, including early work on social value, social enterprise development, improving public, private and social sector networks and developing so social investment mechanisms. So welcome, Ian. We'll come to you first in a tick. Um, Ian's Twitter handle, Harry, could I ask you to put that in the chat for everybody, please? Um, I'm also delighted to be welcoming Anne-Louise Clark, who's just joined Audit Wales as an executive director or the executive director for communications and change. Anne-Louise uh, previously worked at Blyna Gwent County Borough Council as chief officer for commercial and as part of the senior leadership team had to pivot her focus in March of last year to respond to the initial and ongoing impact of the pandemic. So this has meant leading her team to the establishment of a new locality response service to support the community, enabling the workforce to work effectively remotely and the creation of the Test Trace Protect uh, programme and team for Blyna Gwent. Uh, also joining us from across the pond is Dr. Todd Howlett. Welcome, Todd. Hi. Who's the Nova Scotia Provincial Medical Director for 811, which is a triage and health information line. Central Zone is the home to half the population of Nova Scotia and houses the tertiary and quaternary health services for the province and in some cases the other Atlantic provinces too. During the last year he's been closely involved in both the front end as well as the back end of the Nova Scotia pandemic, COVID pandemic response. So Croiso, Todd, delighted to have you with us today. Um, also we have Professor David Snowden, Dave um, can you give us a wave, please, from where you are? Brilliant, thank you. Dave's from the Canubian Centre. He's had a career that's included working for IBM with the US government following the 9-11 attacks and went on to develop the Canubian framework, which we'll hear more about later, which is at the heart of the EU handbook, which we'll talk about today too, and is a synthesis of years of work in the fields of complexity and crisis management. So a great lineup of speakers for you all. Uh, Harry's put their um, handles in the in the chat and the Twitter handle for the whole event is hashtag COVID-19 learning. So there's plenty on that stream too. So we are going to hear from our speakers for the next sort of 40 minutes or so, 45 minutes. And then we're gonna have a good chunk of Q and A from all of you in the room too. So do please get your thinking caps on, um, address, um, uh, put your questions in, in the chat, and if you want to address them to particular speakers, please make that clear, but don't send them to that particular speaker. We're having this as a meeting rather than a webinar, so we can all see each other, because God knows we need all the human contact safely that we can have at the moment. Um, so I'm going to, I'm just going to take us back, Ian, first of all, to where we were a year ago. March 20, and it's hard to go back that far, I know. March 2020, public services in Wales were reeling from the impact of storm Dennis, and we're about to enter another, another huge storm um, with stretched resources and on the surface, limited capacity to respond. What we did have was staff, physical assets, and the communities that we, we served. Can you tell me, please, 
uh, as a senior leader working in public services, what that last this last year has been like from your own perspective. Pananda, good afternoon, and thank you for the introduction, Ariel. And I'm I'm going to try and rise to that challenge that you've set us. Um, I think just following on from the introduction, I'm foremost a public servant, um, like all of you in the room. I'm currently serving Wrexham County Borough Council as Chief Executive, and I think it's really important to recognise our organisation serves the people and place of Wrexham. And I think they're really important starting points in terms of thinking about the pandemic. Um, my input today is going to be slightly clumsy, because I think we're in the middle of a really complex set of issues with the pandemic. And like you, I'm struggling to make sense of the journey in terms of where we've been, where we are now, and where we're heading. And I think this session is a really important um, piece of reflection that's beneficial for all of us and for myself. I'm going to try and make sense of the last year by telling some stories of my experience, some about me, some about Wrexham Council, and also some about Wrexham as a place that hopefully provides some insight into my take on trying to use some dynamic strategy during the last year. I guess my first story is about truth and honesty. And it, it needs you to be rugby fans because there was a rather big game the other weekend between Wales and England. And you need to understand my context really for this story to make sense. That I was born in England, I live and my home is in Wales and my children are Welsh, and I played rugby to a pretty high standard. So I have three versions of the truth. When I was speaking to my Welsh colleagues and particularly people in sports Wales, we played better and deserved to win. When I speak to my English relations, we lost because of the referee. And when I speak to my rugby player colleagues, the decisions ruined the game as the referee became the man of the match. So if I'm honest, I feel all three of those things. And I know that this causes conflict within me. That's not wrong. It's just who I am and the situation that we're in. So I guess thinking about entering the pandemic, values as an organization in Wrexham Council, we've been working on prior to the pandemic is a big thing, having been at the council for almost two years. Honest conversations was the starting point of that, that we're able to talk to people openly and with trust about the situation as one place. Secondly, acting as one council so that we're coherent as an organisation. And at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, it was really about getting a sustained focus on that messaging continued, but adding two pieces or two extra values we talked about the importance of tolerance, that everybody was going to have emotional meltdowns during COVID, and that certainly happened in my case. But if we're supportive and tolerant of the people we're working with, we can expect a lot out of them as public servants because we're giving a lot to them. I think really interesting for me, actually, we've just done an employee survey, and what we've seen amongst our frontline staff is, during COVID, their clarity of vision the feedback they're getting from people in the organisation, their engagement and their pride in their job has gone up really significantly. So it does show that it's a catalyst for change as well. In terms of leadership entering the pandemic, we've taken this approach of actually we're collectively responsible as a leadership team for major issues and with our lead councillors, our lead members. So that means if we've got a big service issue or a big community issue or a big organisational issue, that it's a collective responsibility that we play roles within. But I think that sharing of major issues has been really significant to helping us cope during the situation. And also we've extended that out. We have a top common purpose group in Wrexham with leaders in the private, public and social sectors working towards one common purpose. So that honest conversation pervades out into the community. So I thought it's important when COVID hit the strong values, collective leadership, some honest conversations, and they've been critical to maintain resilience. It was actually a pretty good job because we've got a lot of issues as well in terms of we're a high risk area for COVID. We're a major urban area in Wales. We're on the border. We've got high industry levels and we've got high numbers of students. We're an area of political contestability. So our leadership has three different groups that come together to form an alliance. Our assembly members are different political parties to those groupings and our MPs are different political parties to our assembly members. So a lot of what we do becomes very political and very contestable. We're halfway through major change programmes and some really fundamental services that are high risk, including education and children's services. 
and we're in the middle of our major planning framework that's hugely controversial um, and caused some real issues at a local community level. But we've set a clear vision around place, people and economy. We've narrowed down our priorities to six in terms of what we needed to do. And also we were thinking about this golden coil rather than golden thread, that it's about outcomes, it's about our people, and it's about our resources that we apply to achieve those outcomes, but very much set in this political context. So at the start, it is, was, and still is overwhelming. From a crowded house perspective, it was four seasons in one day, but from my perspective, we had three emergencies in one day. We were dealing with a suspected package at Watt Hart, one of the vaccine production plants for the COVID vaccine. We were a week after a significant storm Christoph flooding episode um, that had a real impact with the highest levels of the River Dee. And obviously we were still in a COVID pandemic. So dealing with three emergencies in a day, as well as some of those other things, places real stress on an organisation. I think I would ask the question, is there a dynamic, dynamic strategy planned or emergent? I think we have a framework in terms of vision, priorities, values, but our actions through the pandemic have emerged through understanding of the situation, thinking about options, acting when we need to take action and the timing of those actions being at the right time and reviewing through learning. In essence, they're the Jessup principles. They also fit with some of the Canevan framework and I'm, I'll stand to be corrected later. But three times a week, we were trying to do those honest conversations assessing the situation, thinking about options, coming up with actions, reviewing and learning. Rowan Foods was a really good example early on in the pandemic, early in the summer, where we had the second factory outbreak, and this predated what we called incident management teams in Wales. Everybody presumed that just like the three sisters in Anglesey, it was being transmitted in the factory setting. Actually, when we got the right people around the table, and because we're responsible as a local authority for making sure issues are right in our area, we insist that it was Leeds in Public Health Wales working with us as NHS, working with us in terms of our community leads. Um, and thank you for all of those that committed to that. We actually modelled out an IMT, an incident management team, before they were taking place. And what that showed us was that actually using hotspot data analysis of where the transmissions were happening, it was happening in our communities and was being brought into the workplace. So it was really important that our strong networks, our use of evidence, getting the right people in the room, helped us then get the message out into those communities and also helped us work on employer workforce relations about traveling into work and how that could be supported. We moved then into September into some sort of recovery phase, thinking that things were going to improve last year. Um, and we started to think about recovery themes. The fact that we needed to address increasing inequity between people who've been affected by the pandemic, really focusing on children and young people in terms of the pressures they faced at key transition points in life, the growing mental health epidemic that was looming, but also taking some of the positives from the carbon agenda in terms of reduction in travel and much greener approaches. So we gold and threaded those in terms of changing our corporate plans and priorities and updating them to actually link to those recovery priorities and mirrored that across in the region in terms of uh, providing a framework with a local emphasis. We get to January and we get the floods. Um, and I suppose this is a good example of is, is it bad planning or is it emergent strategy? Bangalore D sits in the U of the River D. Our evacuation plans take people out to a rest centre about three miles away. At 11 o'clock at night, it's becoming clear that the river's at its highest ever historical level. The bank may collapse. The roads are actually flooded on all sides of Banner on D. We can't get people out to the rest centres. It was the connections and contacts that we had that were able to get people to forward centres on higher ground in the village, knowing those people, ringing them at one o'clock in the morning and adapting our plans that actually provided a safe response to that emergency. Um, it was the strength of the networks and the ability to adapt under pressure that for me is about emergent planning. Um, not necessarily our linear plans being wrong at the beginning. Clearly, we now need to update our plans on Bangor on D and evacuation in light of what we've learned. Striking that call was really important. We had to strike that call to do that at two in the morning, knowing we could get hold of those people because of the strength of our connections with them. If we'd struck it earlier, it may not have been needed. If we'd struck it later, we might have put people at risk. Um, 
I'll come back to a big issue for the council uh, that we're dealing with, and I've just left sessions this morning. The financial pressures are huge. We've got a pressure of six million pounds in our children's services budget because of the work we're doing around transformative change, but also the inability to place people in cheap, cheaper placements um, because of the locking up of the system during COVID. We've managed across the council probably to get that back down to an overall overspend of somewhere in the region of about a million pounds. And we clearly want to make sure children are safe, but not um, put at risk the financial stability of the organisation. I'm so proud that in terms of the council, we're putting 3.5 million next year. For the first time, we're the highest in Wales as a council tax rise of 6.95%. We spend over the notional amount we should spend on public services and have a history of low council tax rises. So the recognition and understanding of the issue from everybody in Repton to address that situation, I think, has been a really key bit of a big systematic jigsaw. So some conclusions for me, I guess, and some basic learning points. Culture is strategy in these situations. Honesty, conversations, network, that was the strength of our emerging strategy. Um, strategy emerges, it needs a framework, and it also needs good foundations around governance and performance, because if you don't have those, you go backwards to address them when you need to be going forwards to actually deal with major issues. Timing of action is critical when they'll have an effect and when the networks that we've got are ready to actually work with us on those actions and understand why they're needed. In terms of um, political interface, it's something I would do different in the future. I think an extended pandemic has really questioned how we work as politicians and officers in a prolonged emergency where the tradition is officers lead emergency planning that creates some real tension. Biggest mistake? Well, I think not loving myself, not understanding myself, and not forgiving myself enough, because if we don't do that, we're not able to do that with the people around us. And it's probably been the most important thing, because the biggest risk for me is the loss of public servants, the loss of you, because of burnout and the pressures that we face. And actually, we need an environment that is so caring to be able to cope. Well, if I've got time for just one very brief last story. Very, very briefly. Yes, you have, Ian. It is very brief. I was walking on Sunday on the River Dee, because I live close to it. There's a big bend in the river. And for the first time ever, the floods had cleared all the vegetation and undergrowth on that bend in the river. I could see all the way back to where I'd come from. And I could see all the way down to the pub that I was going to that clearly isn't open, over the weir and down to calm water. A week ago, I wouldn't have been able to see the way back all the way forward. And I think that's really important in terms of just that messaging about timing and understanding the situation and making sense of it. The Ockendale. Lovely story to finish on. Thank you very much indeed, Ian. And Louise, it's a very easy segue for me into asking you to tell us your story, please, of the last year or your stories. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to kind of tell you a little bit about me as a person going through this so me as a, a kind of leader or hopefully have been a leader during this time and some of the emotional kind of roller coasters there have been highs and there, there's been real lows so much like uh Ian has said it you know we just couldn't believe on the back of the flooding um, in the early part of 2020, just how quickly the grip of the COVID situation, we talked about it, we'd reflected on it, but I don't think anybody could have predicted how it would feel to be leading an organisation and also being responsible for family, friends, changes in personal circumstances, you know, a whole gamut of things that were happening for us all and how we prioritise those things really on a day-to-day -day basis so in terms of dynamic strategy it was so interesting for me I was uh, just a, over a year into my role in Brian and Gwent you know that year when you create the strategic uh, direction for yourself and your team just kind of agreeing all of that with our elected representatives when suddenly the context that those strategies were due to be delivered in changed completely we needed to keep some of that going, but we also needed to prioritise what was in front of us on a daily basis. I can honestly remember returning to, to Ebba Vale the morning after the lockdown had been announced and us looking at each other around that table thinking, have we got what it takes 
Have we got it personally? How will we work together? How will we engage with our elected representatives? And more importantly, what will our role be in leading the community through this most difficult time? And I think uh, I've not checked with my uh, previous colleagues, but I think we all had moments of doubt in those early days as to what actually to do uh, and where to turn. So I can honestly say there were tears, there was anxiety, uh, there was a bit of feeling overwhelmed. And I think some of that was related to the speed with which things happened and the prolonged nature of the emergency. For me, the biggest challenge or biggest opportunity, and I think the thing that I'm most proud of is, is supporting the staff within Blyna Gwent uh, to go and work remotely, to get those practical things in place for people so that they could engage in their work in a safe and secure environment. It was really paramount importance to me that I would not go and start working remotely until every single member of my team was given that opportunity. And I had responsibility for the contact centre and, you know, other people were able to get out, get set up at home quite quickly, but my folk in the, in the contact centre couldn't, but I would not conceive of taking myself into that space that they were safe. So that was number one for me is about how do we look after our people because we need them to be able and confident to step up and step in to some of the spaces that we inevitably thought we would be asking them to do. The other thing that struck me is just how quickly people adapted to utilize their skills for what was needed. So we had people doing all sorts of things that weren't part of their job description and they did it with great presence, great humility. Uh, you know, we had people who were previously in our kind of business support team who stepped into providing support to our communities and kind of wrapping themselves around the community uh, opportunities, finding out what was going on in the community so that we didn't duplicate or get in the way of naturally what the community was doing, but we made sure that we were the connection between our communities and those community activities as far as possible. So amazing people doing amazing things and growing and stretching themselves. You know, the, the term leaned in, I think, is often misused, but by God, we saw some people leaning in, uh, you know, without kind of questioning their pay grade or, or what was required of them or even the hours that they were going to work. I think those first couple of months were a real testament to just how adaptable and flexible people can be when there's a cr really clear need for that. And I'm so incredibly proud of my colleagues at Blyna Gwent. I think the other reflection that I've got is that things just kept layering on. So just when you thought you'd, re you know, you'd got a grip on what was needed and what was going to happen, suddenly another thing would come along and you'd be required to pick it up. So for me, this was TTP. You know, so it was like, right, we need a contact tracing service. Who's going to do it? Uh, can you set one up? First of all, with volunteers from our workforce and from our partners, and then into a more sort of uh, permanent uh, process. We had hundreds and hundreds of applications for those posts. You know, so the actual recruitment process into the TTP was just massive. Um, and once again, people just picked it up and made it happen. Um, you know, with such passion for doing the right thing. So really emotional highs, just, you know, times when we wanted to high five, times when we wanted to crack open the champagne and times when we just wanted to get under the duvet and hope it would all go away. During the summer, we started to see some sort of glimmers of opportunity to, to kind of move our minds from that response mode into a little bit more recovery but that was so short-lived no long you know no faster than the ink was dry on the page of what our recovery priorities would be were we thrown back into that response stage but this time it was different people were tired people were weary people were fed up and also I think the second route that we went down people started to see people becoming ill members of staff their families people started to become ill and 
people started to lose their lives. And I think that has been so heartbreaking after so long that that situation was where we landed and that that situation also coincided with Christmas, where we were asking people to dig deeper again and work over the Christmas period. You know, who would really want to be manning a TTP contact, phoning folk on Christmas Day to say, I need to take your contact details because you've tested positive. All of that at a time when really the system was, was creaking and people were trying their best to protect individuals, local businesses uh, and uh, members of the community. So dynamic strategy, I think if, if there is a thing, it's that need, that ability to constantly look at what you're doing on a daily basis, reflect and refine on a daily basis and move to the place that you need to be where you can do your best work. Um, challenging for our elected members because in terms of their role in supporting the communities, it had to be a very different one. Challenging for us as an organization to keep things going and keep things on track. Proudest thing I've ever done in my life? Probably. So I think I'll leave it there. Thanks very much indeed, Anna Ruth. So some good, um, some good illustrations about the importance of keeping on, keeping on through, um, through it all, but also those different spheres of life that we all have, both sort of personal, family, work, and, and, and the community angle of it. Um, let's go across the waters to Nova Scotia and hear, hear about your experience, Todd, from, from a health perspective, because we couldn't obviously have this conversation at all without having that in the, in the mix, because this is something that has um, obviously affected us all, how we live our lives. I mean, these, are, these, these sound, they are, they sound cliched now because we've lived it all every day for the last year. Tell us, tell us how, how it's been for you, please, Todd. Sure. And Ariel, can you hear me okay? Is everybody can hear me? I can me? hear you absolutely fine. Yeah. Great. Um, <clears throat> perhaps I can just start to explain why I'm here. Um, I want a big shout out to Ray McNeil, who's, you'll see him down there in Nova Scotia Health, who's a friend of David. And David, I, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm thrilled that you, I'm actually on something alive with you. I'm a big fan of your work. You don't know how much I think of what you've done. I like your cap, by the way. I just saw it go across your shoulders. So um, you'll have to tell me later on what your cat's name is. But um, <clears throat> I'll tell you a little bit about, and there's another uh, senior physician in Nova Scotia called uh, David Peachy, who's uh, quite involved in, in uh, complex adaptive systems. And the first time I'd heard about that, I knew there was something there that I needed to learn more about because it, it really fit with what my lived experience was. So. Let me tell you what happened a year ago to me. I'm an emergency physician. And at the time in December, I was what was called the chief of staff of the Dartmouth General Hospital and the provincial medical director for our 811 teletriage system. In January, my boss left and I got asked to fill in for him to be the central zone medical director um, for Halifax Regional Municipality. So it's about half the population, the academic associated with Dalhousie University. It's, it's a big job. Um, and I, I leaned into that. There's the leaning in and, uh, and started that position. Um, and as an emergency physician, we were beginning to hear stories coming out of Italy, actually. And some of them were unbelievable, but what was happening, and it was coming through non-traditional networks. It was not coming through anybody else other than a physician knew a physician and they were telling us stuff. And it was unbelievable what we were hearing, but it became clear that something was ahead of us. Um, and as COVID started to spread, um, I was asked to go to an inter uh, a news conference um, with the government. Um, and I remember very vividly, it was almost about a year and a, and a week ago, I was standing there and as they started to present, I knew in at least my 811 job, what was about to happen the following week. And it was going to be dramatically different. And I had some experience during H1N1 that this was going to happen. And I looked at the, operations manager and I said, do you know what's going to happen next week? And she said, no, I said, we need to book meetings for the next three days, something, uh, our volumes at 811 are going to um, go up probably tenfold. And she looked at me and said, that's not going to be possible. And that's what happened the next week. So um, 
so one of the fascinating things that I got to experience was that um, we became a group of, of people. And in my role as 811 chief, we connected with the medical officers of health, the chief medical officer of health, and a number of other people to look at how the front end of this would look, how we would start assessing people, swabbing them and screening them. And it was emergent. It, it was not, we did not have it well planned. We had some experience with it and we tried to enact some of that and I'll maybe talk about that later. Um, over time, uh, that changed quite dramatically. And I'd like to say, David and Ray, that I did use some of the principles here to, to make some suggestions of how we could connect different people. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and I'll stop there and just say, for whatever reason, Nova Scotia has been recognized as one of the best um, jurisdictions for the response that we had to, uh, to COVID. And I think the reasons are complex. They, some of them are political, uh, right down to when our, where our premier was in his trajectory to his relationship with the chief medical officer of health, to the, the people in, in our province. But overall, we fared fairly well. Um, it was an incredibly stressful time for many of us involved, um, as we said. Um, and, and I'll take a moment and talk about the other part of my job. So at the same time, I was leading a group of physicians who were somewhat and leaders and others who were going through quite a operational organizational change and were quite disengaged. Um, so that was incredibly challenging. And the opportunity of COVID gave us a, a clear purpose to come together. Um, and during that process, we were doing things like um, sorting out our ventilators, our capacity, clearing our hospitals, uh, preparing for the worst case scenario. And, and that was immense. Um, and the data we had for what we had to prepare with was incomplete. So, um, and, and so, as I said, we were, we were trying to make stop COVID and preparing for the worst. And fortunately, as it played out, we didn't see the worst in our, the actual cases and the people we had in our problems were very low. Um, but I just a couple of reflections, if I may, uh, around that, that experience is that um, in 811, we have a regulatory body that regulates us and we have a bureaucracy that exists that is very frustrating and slow and it's often hard to move things ahead. When we got into COVID, like many of, I think I've heard from other people, all that fell away and, and what emerged was the connections that we needed to create to get the decisions done at the time we needed to do them. And that was invigorating and exciting and refreshing for so many that we could finally uh, connect the right people, make the right decisions to get things moved ahead. Um, as we heard in the summer, as things got better, some, some of those uh, um, uh, some of the, those uh, other structures reemerged. Um, and and at that point, I think we had become more purposeful to point out that, the connections needed to be different. And, and I'm here to tell you that we were able to do that. We were able to bring other non-traditional people into the fold. And what emerged from that is, I would say, um, the result of that, and some of that's been published, is a very uh, uh, unique, innovative approach, even around our testing modalities pop up and everything else. So it, it was incredible. The other uh, reflection I have is, in the academic environment, many of our people responded to a complex problem, uh, very much in a with a complicated approach. Everything was written out, um, and it was very clear to me that as soon as we'd written it out and it um, and it, it had first contact, we were going to have to change it again. And we, I was not successful at moving us to more of an emergent, complex approach to recognize that. Uh, we needed to iterate, evaluate. It, there was a real sense amongst at least a number of our academics that we just needed to write all out every eventuality. And what, what resulted from that, interesting enough, was that every time we tried it, it had to be changed again in a, in a very frustrating, difficult way. And, and we're now evaluating 
um, going forward, how we might approach that differently. So, and then the last thing, if I could say to you is, um, and I hear about your flooding is, we had a, um, a horrific event in uh, March of last year uh, that you may or may not have heard about it. It was a ma one of the worst mass shootings and killings in Nova Scotia and it involved a, um, a fellow that actually had traveled throughout the province shooting a number of people. And it really galvanized the province and in, in, in a way that was both horrific and I guess everybody came together and the thing Nova Scotia Strong came out of that. That weekend for me, just to share this story, was one of the most challenging personal weekends because I was away. I'd gotten called by the CEO of the province in my role as executive medical director to ask for us to come into the biggest nursing home we have in the province to help them because there had been a number of deaths there and they needed our help. So we were showing up that day. And, and as I showed up that day, I then got a call that this mass shooting had happened. And I, I remember at the time, just personally that being, you know, the real sense amongst us in the room was what more could possibly go wrong um, today that, you know, we're, we're in this and, and we've done that. So um, leave this in a pause note, we've come through that, the resiliency, the emergent, the, the, we are now desperately trying to capture what we've learned to maintain it. I'm desperately trying to inform the people about how our structure needs to be different going forward and what we can learn from it. So I'll stop there and, and I'll leave my uh, email in the chat box in case anybody wants to get in touch with me. That's great. Thanks very much indeed, Todd. And Dave, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna come to you in a tick. I've done um, one of my um, speed reading challenges to whiz through the EU handbook since we last, since we last spoke. And interesting to pick up on some of the some of the things that are coming through from the conversations now. I shall leave it to you to to pull those threads together. But just from what we've heard from the three speakers, there's some things here about storytelling and the multiplicity of experiences needing to be heard in different in different ways. Trust and relationships, and which ones matter most? I think as a as a thread to pull that collective responsibility and how you shorten the line of command and what does command look and feel like in different stages of this, of this experience. Um, how you deal with the relentlessness that's come through from a number of, a number of uh, the, the stories that we've heard so far, the relentlessness of things being piled on, not just the same experience being, being continued kind of temporarily through time, but also here's another thing and another thing and another thing. And we've got to, reconfigure that all as a sort of 3D uh, Rubik's Cube all around us. And we can't take ourselves out of that situation at all and get any respite from it because it's everywhere. It's where we live, it's where we work. It's in all our relationships with our children, with our coworkers, with our friends, with our parents. So that relentlessness, I think, is something that we need to, we need to be looking at um, today too. I want to come back in the Q&A to this, this thing about when do you notice that the phase is changing from that crisis response and how long that crisis response is? And I want us to talk a little bit about recognize, recogni recognizing when you're shifting from one state to, to another and what sort of things you need to do to, to mark that. Um, there you are, there's some starters for 10, but Dave, tell us how the EU handbook would help us to make sense of this and how it can still help us now because we're still in this, aren't we? I think, um, I mean, that's a really good summary, Aurel. Um, and I, I can actually tell a story to illustrate what we're trying to do with a handbook. You, anybody can achieve good results in a crisis. Yeah, the trouble is you can only hold crisis behavior for a certain period of time. And our overall problem as a society is we haven't got long COVID, we've got permanent COVID. Yeah, and we've got worse things coming. I said in a big conference call in the States the other day, because you have to use religious language in the States these days to get attention, that COVID was God's gift to humanity because it was a wake-up call. You know, compared to what we're going to get afterwards, there are worse things happening. And this is a matter of preparing yourself. So I grew up in uh, Mold or with Greek, just 11 miles up the road from Ian. 
And I was saying I still held the Allen School record for the fastest transit between Mould and Wrexham in your father's car, which I'm still quite proud of. I'll tell the story of that later if people want. But um, my mother had fought away out of Cardiff docks on scholarships in the late 40s and early 50s, went to a university in Germany. Um, so as far as she was concerned, I was taken back to Cardiff every holiday. So I didn't think I was a gog when I was growing up. So I have this sort of split personality between it. right? And I still have season tickets for the Arms Park. But one of the key things when I was young is I was working on mountain rescue um, in Snowdonia. That was kind of like when I was young and in the days where the entry qualifications were kind of like you could just turn up and you could help out, to be honest. And if you go walking in the mountains a lot, um, you can handle adverse weather conditions because A, you know what you're doing and B, you're properly equipped and you've been through experiences before. So it's not stressful. Um, but I still remember once we were called out to a woman from Liverpool. She'd been on a coach trip and she'd taken the wrong pathway up from Penna Pass. And she was halfway across Grib Goch, um, wearing a mini skirt and high heels. Now, if anybody knows the area, you'll know this is an incredible achievement. I mean, this is one tough woman, all right? And it took three of us to peel her fingers off the top to actually get her off it, right? But she'd been in a state of crisis, but she wasn't equipped and she wasn't ready. So part of what I want to focus on, and one of the things about the timing of the handbook, is the chance to make changes is while we're still in the crisis, in the process of exiting. Yeah, it's actually not at the start. So to tell the wider story on this, um, some years ago, the European Union adopted the Canavian framework, which was kind of like a good first for Wales, um, as its primary go-to-market model on complexity in government. And they allocated a design team to it. Yeah. And so when COVID hit, the design team, which was head by Alessandra, who's the co-author with me, and we got together and we said, OK, we need to move on this. Yeah. So we can now produce something which has value. And the irony is that normally you produce the theory book and then you write the field guide. This time we wrote the field guide. And I'm now frantically scrambling to write the theory book to go with it. Right. And I think actually that's a good way around because we can be pragmatic. And it has those four basic stages of assess, adapt, exact, transcend. Yeah? Now, that's important because the first thing you've got to decide is, are you really in a crisis or not? Yeah, so if you have planned for this and you've got contingency plans and you know what to do, you're not in a crisis. You kind of like you've got a pathway to follow. Yeah, if you haven't got that, you're going to have to think radically different, differently about the whole process. Yeah? Um, the assess, the adapt stage is very rapid transition. I'll talk about that in a minute. But the key stage, and this picks up on something Anne-Louise Anne said, which is called EXAPT. Now, we introduce two new words in the field guide, and you do this with care, but you introduce new words when you've got a new concept, because you want people to have to think differently. And one of the ones we introduced was EXAPT. Now that comes from evolutionary biology. The principal changes in evolution have come by acceptation, not adaptation. Um, so the classic example is dinosaurs develop feathers for sexual display and warmth. And then there's a class of dinosaurs which are small, which have to run very fast to avoid getting eaten by other dinosaurs. And they develop a skin flap on their forearms to better display feathers for sexual purpose. You can see that as a linear process. And then they run and they start to take off and glide. And that's how we get flight. So a trait which evolved for one function under conditions of stress exacts from a different function. And that applies in the modern age. In 1945, a Raytheon engineer maintaining the magneto of a radar machine noticed that a chocolate bar melted in his pocket. And he then had the bright idea of putting a metal box around the magneto and we got microwave ovens. And of course, there's a classic case of somebody who noticed a rather embarrassing side effect of, of a cardiac drug and mentioned it to a colleague, and that gave us Viagra. So if you look at the history of human innovation, it's actually in the main exaptive or what we call radical repurposing. Um, IBM exapted punch cards. IBM was the world's leader in punch card control of manufacturing process. So they repurposed punch cards to make themselves market leader in computing in the early days of computer science. And I, I could give you many other examples. So kind of like the third stage and key on this is you really need to know what you know as an organization. 
and you need to have mechanisms by which you can repurpose that knowledge very quickly for different functions and different purposes. And that requires you to map it in a head and key on this, there's a whole body of theory behind this, which we won't go into, to do it at the right level of granularity. Yeah, it's the magneto, it's not the radar machine. Yeah, if you don't know what you know in such a way that you can recombine it very quickly, you've got an issue. And there are methods and tools within the UFI guide as to how you do that. That's kind of like a key stage. The other thing, and I think this links in with a key thing Ian said, is informal networks are critical. And actually a small country like Wales is really good at this. I mean, it's, it's both bad and good, all right? Um, but I remember when I got engaged, I drove all the way to Bala from Mould to buy a love spoon. I know I should have spent all the winter carving it and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, this is a modern age. So I drove to Bala. I got home and my mother turned to me at the door in Mould and said, OK, so who are you getting engaged to? And that was the North Wales you know, network working. Right, You cannot escape a social network. And we all know that one really well in Wales. Right? Um, and I still remember when my mother and father they both died within 10 days of each other within a busty Gwyneth. And I've never seen a network like the Welsh speaking nurses with the Welsh speaking district nurses actually work to mitigate the harm of cancer in a way that was independent of the formal system. And I'd say that from a whole body of work we're doing in local government and health services is there's a total dependency on the informal networks to mitigate the impact of the formal systems. And of course, in a crisis, we fall back to that. So there's another whole body of methods within the field guide, which is called entangled trios, something we're currently doing big experiments with in Florida, in which you need to actually manage the entanglement of roles across society so that you design the system to increase those networks. So you don't rely on accidental networks, you have deliberate purpose. So that's kind of like one key lesson which comes out. And there's a formal method for that and we're ready to run some more work on that. Yeah. We're also looking at that in the NHS at the moment because the mental health breakdown over the next nine months is gonna be worse than COVID. And if we can increase narrative-based network density on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, we can radically reduce the impact of, of mental health. So we can reduce the amount which flows into the formal system. Yeah. And that's something which is also part of the field guide, which we're getting ready to launch. Yeah. So some of these things are kind of like urgent, do it now. And that links in with one of the main themes within, within the guide is the concept of a human sensor network. And in government, that means a citizen sensor network. So we've done work in Wales in the Valleys Project, um, in Malmo around refugees, in Colombia around the peace process, in Egypt around a whole bunch of stuff, and also in Pakistan and elsewhere, in which we've used children as ethnographers to their own communities. And that allows us to map attitudes. And so you can start to look at it, if we had been able in Wales or England to look at an attitudinal map of people around COVID in real time, that would have allowed us to take a more fractal approach to lockdown because and not just rely on behavioral scientists and big data it's real data for real people backed up by narrative that's kind of like a principle of that approach it's also something which works off wisdom of crowds if you can put a put a position to a thousand people and they interpret that position you can produce a map of consensus views and outlier views now, the outlier views are critical. I mean, this is a famous example. If you give radiologists a batch of x-rays and ask them to look for anomalies, and on the final x-ray, you put a picture of a gorilla in plain sight, which is 48 times the size of a cancer nodule. On average, 83% of radiologists won't see it, even though their eyes scan it. And the 17% who do see it come to believe they were wrong when they talk with the 83%. Now, this is called inattentional blindness. Human beings cannot avoid it. Yeah, because in evolutionary terms, it's better to make decisions very, very quickly based on a partial data scan privilege in our most recent experiences. So part of the role of a human sensor network is to find the 17% before they talk to anybody else. Because during a crisis, you need to create outliers. Yeah. So entangling networks, building informal networks, building sensor networks that can give you real-time feedback are key. I was talking with somebody in the NHS yesterday and they've got reports coming in now about post-traumatic stress 
in the NHS in England, but it's based on studies they did in April and May, and they're getting the reports now. Uh, we're looking at doing real-time lessons learned capture in the field, that's again part of the field guide, and looking at whether mental health indicators come through the way that people index their lessons learned. Yeah, so we got real-time indicators. So that the human sensor network is a really important part of the field guide. Um, I think the other thing I'd want to say here is, I'm going to stop in a second because the questions are more important. The boundaries of the organization are starting to break down radically. Uh, so some of the work we've been doing up in Scotland is to look at linking teachers with pupils with parents. And of course, parents are doing jobs. And we've actually found that parents who are health workers find it very valuable to tell a story to their child when they come back. It's a cathartic process. And if the child is acting as a journalist, that moves into a lessons database. But then, of course, the teachers can be linked with health workers. So I think one of the things we're going to have to start doing is government and industry is to start to see that people are now working in environments where they need to be localised support. I mean, I now live in a small village in Wiltshire next to Avebury. Um, I claim I'm on Welsh territory because the dike behind our house was the peace settlement in 357 and we didn't betray it, right? So I can claim that credit. But there's actually a garage in the village where somebody's opened an artisan bakery. Yeah, and the pizza is brilliant and the bread is brilliant and people are now going around to that. Now, that, I'm not making a point about local food. I'm saying communities are starting to create higher levels of interdependency one with each other because people don't have the sort of social interaction of work. And again, this concept of human sense networks and entanglement is about increasing those support levels. So the field guide has a lot more in it than that. It's the outcome of 20 years work. This stuff started on counterterrorism work, which I did with the US government um, before and after 9-11 on weak signal detection. So you can see where there's some of this comes from. And I still remember Admiral John Poindexter, who you might remember was Ronald Reagan's national security advisor. The first time he saw the Canadian framework, he said that explains 50 years of failure in American foreign policy. Yeah, we, we've treated the complex as if it was complicated. And if you don't know it, and we can all be proud of this as Welsh, Canavin is taught at command level in every US armed forces. Yet you do not get to command level without knowing the Canavian framework. So we, we got one Welsh word well established, if nothing else. Right? Um, but we're about to launch, um, the, the whole thing will launch with the EU in the 15th of April. Yeah? It will come with it with a full assessment process. And we're happy to work with people here on that. Right? So if people are interested, we're already working with Chris at the Welsh Audit Office with Ray in Nova Scotia, because these are 10 year long partnerships, is where are we, what should we do next? Yeah. And this is what I'm calling the frozen two strategy. Sorry, I can't resist this one. Um, somebody told me the other day I had to watch frozen two. Now, my daughter is now 31 years old and writing critical essays about my inability to understand Deleuzian epistemology. It's quite scary when your daughters do that to you. And I haven't got grandchildren yet. So this is now sad old man watching Frozen 2 over a Waitrose takeaway curry one evening. And I, if I honest, I quite like it. And the reason I quite liked it is there's a wonderful phrase in Frozen 2. It says, do the next right thing. Yeah? And if you want a lesson for complexity, watch that film. In fact, I'm now about to create a management special course on Frozen 2 and Aristotelian virtue ethics, because they're actually the same problem. Faced with uncertainty, the key thing is to know what's the next right thing you can do, which keeps the most options downstream. So as I say, the assessment process around the field book and everything else will help people do that. And it's also the final point I want to make. The fact it's an EU Commission field book and it's a book, not a paper, is actually quite important because that de-risks adopting the ideas. Okay. And oh, yeah. one of the things we see is Wales as a potential centre of excellence for this because there's a role worldwide to be a centre of excellence on citizen engagement. And Wales has actually pioneered this work with measuring the mountain and the valleys project. And so that's one of the other ambitions we've got here. And that's what we call Rainers, this, the small countries project. Small countries can move faster than big countries and they can do it in alliance. Dave, thank you very much. Um, 
I think the um, do the next right thing is also in Trolls from my extensive um, <laughs> watching of videos and things over the last years and uh, certainly over the last year, but even before that. Um, and you've also brought a new word into our family lexicon as well, something I've always called fridge blindness, as in open the fridge, where's the whatever. I shall now tell my children that it's inattent inattentional blindness, so jochen war for that. We've all had to learn a new, a new language in, in lots of different ways over the last year. Um, and there's lots of questions coming through. Thanks, Chris, for pulling them through from the chat. If you've got names for people who've asked particular questions, that's great. If they're all yours, that's also okay. But just tell me, please, if you could, that would be, that'd be brilliant. I want to pick up on um, the, this first one, which is around the challenges of, um, of, of these informal networks, because it takes time it takes investment and it takes resources. It takes people to do that. And those are things that are all in short supply when you're in the middle of, when you're in the middle of a crisis. So Anne-Louise, I'm gonna to come to you first with my question on this, because there's something there about, um, you know, Dave's talked about how, how we recognize the moment that we're in and how we self-interpret the information that you have and give it meaning and recognize that every single story you have could be used by somebody else for a purpose of which you have no clue, but they might. So how do mm. we get people to have, um, to sort of recognize the value of what they, of what they have and can share? Mm. And is that something that you, that you, that rings true for you? Yes. Yeah, so, so really interesting. So I think um, the informal networks have been absolutely critical in strengthening our ability to make sense of what's going on. So um, being an organization, so, so being an, an organization plunged into this situation, the immediate kind of feeling I had was I had to get my superhero pants on and kind of solve everything for everybody. And there was a danger in that in terms of stepping on what the community, what our communities were already doing themselves. And so the challenge was finding their stories, actually, and making sure we understood their, what they were doing. Some things just emerged specifically COVID related. And, and where, some, where did you find those stories? Well, so it was a bit like, um, we did a bit of mapping in the traditional, you know, let's get a map of everything. And actually what we found is the more that we mapped and, and got in touch with people and, and community leaders who weren't formal community leaders, um, the more information we found and the more uh, connections that we made. So we saw our role as making sure that we, we didn't get in the way, but we didn't duplicate. We didn't kind of try and, and do something that everybody else was doing. And we would tell the stories of those informal networks so that we would be giving um, visibility to, to what people were doing and how they could get involved and how they might be part of that, that movement. And a lot of this, I mean, you know, in the communities in Blyna Gwent, they're very, very close communities. Lots of people know each other. Lots of people are related. Lots of people who work for the council are also part of those communities. So it was, it was kind of using all those community assets to really gather the stories together and make sure that people were aware of the wealth of things that were going on um, in, in the areas that they were residents in. And that was through regular Facebook posts or regular, yeah, or a lot, text yeah, a lot messaging of, or what? Anything that we could do really. So we established um, very early on, on the back of people being required to shield, we established a kind of like a locality response team. And this was drawn from various people across the organization who'd never done that type of stuff before, you know, because it was often for bits of service that weren't at full operational capacity as we stood down some of the less critical services. What we found is that people just had connections and we promoted it through Facebook, not necessarily, not necessarily our own Facebook, but sharing Facebook um, links with other people. Uh, we did some work with local businesses to find out, you know, what were they able to do for residents? So we used our connections like our environmental health team who would have been 
you know, looking at the businesses and seeing what was happening for them during the lockdown, our business regeneration, using those opportunities that we had to really share information around our community businesses, who was doing what, what part, uh, what some of our partners were involved in. So, you know, we've got a partnership with the Anira and Leisure uh, Trust. They were furloughing a lot of their teams. So how could we utilize what they knew through their, their previous work? So it was really being very curious and very, um, yeah, kind of looking for opportunities all the time to link people together. Ian, there's, there's um, you know, so the case has been made for, for informal networks, but local governments in Wales have had budgets cut to the bone. Um, how do you spend money on things where there's no return on investment in financial terms, which is tricky? Um, so I'm going to leave that with, with you. But I also want to get to, how, to a question from Sam, which was, how do we move from the small scale ad hoc solutions to things that are bigger scale? And the kind of, you talked about the space that you're responsible for in terms of Wrexham, but you've also talked about the sort of liminal nature of that space being on the edge of the country um, and needing therefore to coordinate with multiple different others because, you know, apart from when we were absolutely in firm lockdown the whole time, people couldn't, couldn't move. So can you talk us through some of those sorts of challenges and how you make sure that what you're doing um, as much as possible, um, you're either learning from others who are doing it better than you and how you found that out or how you shared your good practice in a way that that sort of um, the ripples went went wider. So there's two questions for you there, please. That first one around um, recognizing what the return on investment is. Okay, so I think the first thing is it it brings home, doesn't it? Possibly, you know, what we've been struggling with in public services um, and particularly local government for the fact that one of our primary roles is an enabler to create an environment, um, not just the deliver of services. And I think that that comes home to recognising the value in that, the public value in that, the, our ability as local government in terms of connecting people together in the space that essentially we have a democracy about and creating agonising debates where people can put in different views and have different opinions. And we grow a confidence and a certainty about that um, generates an excitement about a place and enables people to connect in itself. So I think in terms of how you spend money on those things, well, I think it's really important we do use tools like social value, money being returned in the local economy. We think about inclusive growth coming out of the pandemic and working closer to home because all of those things, actually, we know from our town centre regeneration work that it's areas of our town centre that have been resilient that are the small entrepreneurial areas, not those that have high costs and overheads. So we know in terms of resilience from a retail and economic point of view in the town centre, it's investing in those social areas that is creating resilience for the future. So the, we have social value, we have social return on investment. We have a whole range of ways of thinking about growing resilience and measuring the impact of that to create those cost benefit arguments. I think we have to do it. That's the reality in terms of scaling up and we have an argument and a platform for doing it with the pandemic because it's really, really critical. Um, it's the ability, isn't it, of our communities to be able to solve their own problems with support that is in really critical in terms of, as David said, as we move forward into further issues that are going to be in greater and um, if we disable as local government by only providing that's a real real issue in terms of learning and complexity and um, the different areas of uh, of Wrexham because it's a border area it's part English it's part Welsh it's politically contested um, I guess our learning is making sure that we get messages out in very different ways to different groups and different just out in different ways to different groups and different people, but also that we create an ability for people to say things without feeling that they're going to be attacked and that that's respected um, so that people are able to listen to the views that are put forward 
rather than feeling that there's one common narrative that's only the dominant narrative. Um, so I think for us, it's been just making sure that we grow that sense of respect in terms of the ability to listen. Um, we've shared across sector in terms of some of the work that we're doing. We've obviously done it in a North Wales regional level. We have a strong economic ambition board and also recovery um, coordinating group that started to work very closely around recovery planning. And I think just making sure that we're sharing that in those networks is really critical too. Thank you. Uh, Todd, I'm going to come to you because I think you've got a, 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 two things I want to pick up on from what you talked about before. Firstly, the bringing um, unusual voices into the mix in terms of that uh, early communication and listening exercise at the beginning and how you did that, who they were and why that made a difference is the first one. And then the second one is, you know, you've, you've had... Um, You've had an extraordinarily, uh, I can't say good response because no excess death means that it's a good response um, but to, to COVID. But if you, if you were in, in Wales' shoes now, thinking about how you could cope with the long-term nature of this pandemic and the emotional and mental strain on people, could you talk us through what you're thinking about in terms of that strain and supporting your both your workforce and your communities to see if we can pull, pull any threads back for, for us here in Wales. So those two questions, one, unusual voices, how you involve them. And secondly, what you're thinking ahead of, in terms of the next critical crisis in terms of mental health and that, that just um, wearing down of people's um, just constant attrition of everybody's resources. Yes, um, thank you. And, and just wanted to say, um, um, very appreciative of what's going on here in, in the, uh, the chat box, learning a lot there. Um, on the first issue, I think, you know, there, there was some key people that recognized that we had heard different voices and, and we, we brought them into the fold and, and it created a, some controversy when we did that. Um, but the, and the crisis was so, um, significant that we needed to. Um, why, why did that happen? Um, I think it's, it's, it's multifactorial. It was relationship-based. Nova Scotia is a small place. There was a certain amount of trust that we had built amongst certain people so that when we said we needed to bring somebody else to the table, that, that was allowed. Um, it was uncomfortable. It, it, was, it was different and, uh, and it challenged many of our normal uh, um, structures that some people that were suddenly at the table who, you know, who were, might be perceived should not be there. But um, I think there was there was enough trust that we could bring people in, and, and then the results spoke for themselves after we did that. So that was the first thing. Um, Todd, can David, I just pick up? Can I just yeah. pick up on that? How did you yeah. how did you make sure the space was there for them to come in? Did you just say this is happening? I'm pushing this through. You you know get get with the program kind of thing well it um, was no it, <laughs> in many of these things it's much more than that you call three people you tell people you convince somebody um you you um and it and it was it was not that simple it, but many times it was in some ways it was provocative in other ways it was less so but it, it was it, it did um i think there was a sense that we there was some strong voices that said hey we that, that we're willing to be, um, I guess the word I'd use is vulnerable to say, we don't know what we don't know. There are other people that we need to hear from now and, and it's important that we do so. Um, so it took some courage and some, I would use the word vulnerability to actually go there. Um, uh, so I think that that's what happened. Um, uh, it would be interesting to, to actually examine how that actually happened. Um, that's, that would be my reflection on that. The, the second issue, David, I heard you talk about the, the mental health crisis and it is immense here as well. Um, during the first wave, I remember speaking to the chief of psychiatry and we were seeing uh, people in acute psychosis that they had never seen before. We're not, you know, we're not, we're talking about um, true psychosis. Um, so it, it was, the, the strain was immense, um, both right from that level to, and we're turning our attention to that, recognizing that uh, the, the knock-on effects are, are significant. 
we, we have uh, a provincial um, uh, group here that, that is very much tuned to this. Um, we're coming up to the Port of Pic shooting, the one the mass shooting, you know, about that. We recognize that, that that's a significant event for the province. And there is a lot of attention to that. Um, and, you know, in non-traditional relationships, we have our foundations. And I was talking to one of our key foundation members before this. And we have a big chain here called Sobeys uh, that has a foundation. And, and they're going to, you know, these are the non-traditional relations that we're, we're really um, have come out of this, in this unified crisis, they're going to put a huge amount of money into mental health and support the process. So it's been really interesting to see that that happen. Um, if I may, um, David, I just I wanted to pick on something you'd said about going forward, how do we create the different connections? And when do we recognize we're in crisis? Um, I, I'm going to say something that may be radical. Many of what we do in healthcare, we're in crisis regularly. And it's not as clear as the crisis that COVID brought us, um, but some of what we learned through COVID needs, we do need to recognize um, in some scenarios, like we have some overcrowding issues and it is a crisis and we need to, we need to, we do not have uh, um, a structure that, that fixes it. And I'm excited by what this has opened up for us to turn to the other crises that may not be specific to the pandemic. So I just, just wanted to say that. So am I, do I understand you right in that? Sorry, just if you could just go on mute so we don't get the feedback, thanks. Um, it's about language needing to transfer into other, into other sectors as well, that last point you're also making. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I, I, think, I think, you know, it was very clear that this external crisis came to us um, but I would suggest that there's a number of internal crises that we're not necessarily identifying as such, and and the and their current structures are not dealing with adequately. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm I'm quite interested in exploring that and how how we can use how can we use some of the Kinevin framework and the like that that's been so useful for this other crisis for this or. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got loads of questions and I'm conscious of time ticking by. We've probably got time for a couple more and then the rest of them I'm gonna pass on to the Good Practice Exchange team at Audit Wales who will think about what to do next with them. But I know um, uh, Paul Matthews is in, is in the room today. We talked about how it's very, um, so Paul, there's your heads up. I'm gonna to come to you in a tick. Um, it's, it's really difficult to hold that uncertainty around um, and, and it can be hard to say that you don't, you don't have all the answers, um, you need to listen, you also need time to, to reflect on a decision, your first decision isn't, your first instant isn't necessarily the right thing to do, but often it, it can be. So that trust in your own decision making is important and that transmits itself to, to other people in, talk, in, in terms of also how you communicate more publicly. So how that how your organization becomes that point of confidence for, for citizens who look to you, people will inevitably um, gravitate to things and people who provide a level of uncertainty when there is so much around them at every level and reassurance, because that's a very human thing as well to need that kind of reassurance. Um, Paul, I'd like you to um, talk about what you've learned from your experience, please. But I'd also like everybody else, here's everybody else's cue, to put in the chat, please, an example of a great communicator and what you've appreciated about how they've communicated with you. Um, uh, so that we can all, because we will know, we will share, I suspect, some of the ones who are, who are very visible good communicators in our own respective spheres, but we're also going to need to know about communicators in other spheres too, who we don't know yet. And I know we do say in Wales that, yes, we're a small, very networked country, but not everybody knows each other. And we need to keep remembering this. And we need to keep bringing new people into these conversations. So if you could do your own bit of homework, please, that's going to provide a treasure trove for Chris and the team to follow up on afterwards. But Paul, um, if you could um, tell us a little bit about your, your journey, please. There you are. 
I can find you on my screen. I was eating a Mars bar then. Sorry, that's, really that's, sorry. That's, that's hardly fair. I, I gave you a minute or two, <laughs> but we can't tell uh, if you've got any stuck between your teeth, so you're fine. Carry on. <laughs> Uh, very quickly, uh, um, at, at risk of sort of recanting what, what, what others have said, you know, you've had the piece about purpose, strategy, values, absolutely um, g givens. What, what surprised me, when you said when you opened up, you know, uh, you were asking people whether they can remember last March. I can remember as if it, if it, as if it was yesterday. Um, it, it's not drifted at all. I can remember the palpable fear, the anxiety, and one thing that surprised me was that there were a number of public bodies that weren't ready because we'd been watching pictures for, for three months. Uh, and I have to say, anybody that felt the English Channel was going to hold this back, in, in my view, was incredibly naive. So it wasn't a case for us of waiting for, for Boris Johnson to say we're going into lockdown. We, we'd already started to spin up, and I'm, and I'm sure lot, lots of other people had. Um, that The politics in our organisation was sorted before that. Um, the... the the lines were clear. We, we had a sense that we were fronting up to an 18-month mission. And I still stand by that. I think it'll be 18 months before we get the chance to just take breath, even though there have probably been sort of five or six staccato uh, uh, key, key moments where we've, we've stopped, we've evaluated, we've asked ourselves some big questions in terms of whether we're focused on the right things and the things that only we could do. And I think that's, that was an important, that's been an important part of our learning. What are the things that only we can do? What are the things that we're best placed to do? And what are the things that we don't need to become involved in? And, and I have observed I, from, from my perspective, some people sometimes get involved in things that they don't need to. Um, and God bless you if you've got the extra energy. Um, but but we, we weren't clear on that. We were very clear that we weren't going to come through this on the basis of adrenaline. Uh, adrenaline is a, is a intoxicating drug, isn't it? But it's short term. Um, and it's not surprising that people hit a wall if they if they design response on the basis of that. Um, we were also very clear, not not wishing to be a, a lone state or anything of that nature, but we were not going to place ourselves in the position of being in a principal agent relationship with anybody. Um, we took a view very very clearly that we were appropriately placed to offer leadership to our our county, um, and we felt able to do it. Um, the politicians we were absolutely open to it being a human stance, not organizational. Um, they were absolutely open to rapid communication, engaging participative communication, not broadcasting, and being very, very clear from pre-day one that we would be there at the beginning, in the middle, at the end, and we would still be there after. Um, so well, can, I, can, I, can I just jump in? I guess two things. In order to do that and to put a face to, to, to that, communication it needs you need often to hive off some of the operational day-to-day decision making to, to a kind of to, to somebody else so that they can get on with it because you need to be part of that because there's a figurehead role to play there yeah uh, absolutely can you this talk is, us through some of that this is about elite teams being elite you know this isn't about lone rangers is it you know when, no. when, when, when you're faced with these circumstances i think ian caught it quite nicely um, I don't think the human being has yet been born that can can operate at a, a permanently high level. Um, you know, you you have to design in sabbaticals. You have to have trust in the people around you, and you have to be very very clear in terms of the roles w within a team that you're going to play and when you're going to pivot out of those. So conscious choice, conscious leadership, really engaged participative leadership. I think has been a, I'd like to think has been a feature of our top team. And our top team has got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, you know, you've heard stories of others about involving different voices. I'm not going to, you know, walk, walk you back through that. But if you, if if you got certainly if you're a council, if you're going to put a persona to, to your organisation, if you're going to put a face, a voice, a smile, a sense of humour, because there's been lots and lots of space in the last twelve, last 12 months for humour, um, then. I think you've just got to put yourself out there. You know, you've got to be prepared to take some knocks. You know, the world of social media is not, it's not a fun train all the time, is it? But you're not entitled to just sort of go home and sort of weep in the corner if you've had a bad day or a bad tweet. Um, if you're trying to build yourself as a, a place of confidence, you've got to roll with the blows sometimes. And also, from, from my experience, be it good or bad and useful or not, every now and again, you've got to t take on some, some idiots and, and put them down. Um, you know, particularly when you've got people that are, you know, cr talking crazy language that's dangerous. I think if you're going to take a position of public leadership, 
you have to be able to talk to that and you have to be prepared to. So I, for me, it's a combination of all those skills, those, those, sort of, those hard, those soft, those, those empathetic skills. Uh, and at one level, I think you've got to learn to project a personality through a screen um, and through 140 or 280 characters. But you can't have a day off. You've got to be there because no. people don't take a day off. They're, they're, their families are dying. They're, 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 they're fr- their friends are coming close. And whether we deserve to be those points of confidence or not, you know, that, you know, in my organization, I'm the worst person to ask. It's, it's the hundred thousand people that live in Monmouthshire that, that should, will answer that question at some point in time. But if you, if you strike out on, on this approach, you can't back off. There's, yeah. there's no way of backing off. You've got to stay the course. And that is all about managing energy. Paul, thank you. I think one of the themes obviously for, for this is all about that personal resilience obviously, and how you recognise and enable people to take breaks when they feel also responsible for continuing to, to, be, in, to be in that space um, day in, day out, and being the one who, who, who can hold it, hold it together. Um, I can see a load of uh, great leaders coming, um, coming through in, in the chat. I just encourage you to put a few more in as well. And Chris, I guess there's a question there in terms of how we bring people together to share those experiences more broadly across sectors and across spaces. Because certainly where we sit at the IWA, we can see some great examples of lesson learning continuing within sectors or within places. But it hasn't always um, spread across across sectors and across places, across both of those things. So there needs to be more sort of cross-pollination, which is also going to take resourcing as we go forward. We've got a couple of minutes, and um, the brief for me is how, how, do we, how do I sum up this conversation? I'm not, I'm not sure. It's always, the, it's always a tricky thing right at the end. Dave, I'm going to come back to you, which is, um, I think you've posed a question, and you literally have one minute on this, okay? Um, so keep, keep that focus in terms of how we change the process. You asked the question, so I'm going to get, ask, ask you to answer it, please. I think with regret, the one thing which won't work is just gathering stories about what worked well and worked badly and promising we'll do better next time. I mean, that just happens all the time and it's a terrible temptation. We actually have to change the processes. Um, there are three basic rules in the EU handbook. One is in a crisis, you centralize, you coordinate in the centre, you distribute decision making. And that's really important. We train people in that. Because if you make decisions in the centre, things go badly wrong. Your role is to coordinate and connect. In fact, that's a general sea level responsibility. The second is communicate by engagement. It's, it's actually, I'm not interested in how good people were at communicating because that's not sustainable. What actually means is we have to, and this is the, the, the sensor networks, we have to engage people so that they can see what to do rather than we have to tell them. And I think that communicator engagement is a key one. And the third one is we need to build capability that means the system can handle problems we can't yet anticipate, right? It is actually very cheap to stimulate the formation of informal networks. It's very expensive to build formal systems. So we have to create an ecosystem that can respond to the ongoing and next crisis so that we don't have to do all this stuff in the centre. And that's what the field guide is about. That's a nice... uh... It's a nice segue into something I did for a couple of years, which is I went in as a senior international NGO leader in these sorts of crisis situations to to play the curveball role at Shrivenham, which was hosting um, uh, NATO training for um, uh, commanders going into UN missions who couldn't get to the places where NGO leaders could get to because we didn't ever carry arms, obviously. And we were, would say, well, what happens if, what do you do if this happens? What do you do if this happens? Um, to, to sort of throw some of those curveballs into the conversation, which built relationships if you ever came across any of those people on the ground as well, which was a kind of added, added bonus. But recognizing and valuing different people's perspectives. Um, we have a minute to go. Uh, Chris, I know there's a huge part of, you know, part of this conversation is what this conversation is part of a whole week of, of COVID learning. Do you want to just say a little bit about um, what you're going to do with the output? I know the video is going to go up on the Audit Wales website and will be available for other, other people too. But in terms of responding to some of the other questions, for instance. Should really pass this on to Beth, but is that okay? Sure, Beth, over to you then. Yeah, that's fine, Chris. Um, So yeah, as Oriel said, we will kind of 
collate everything we've seen today in the chat. Um, and we'll probably be looking at the kind of key messages coming through that we can share through our blog, potentially um, look at, as we mentioned, we've just set up a recent podcast. So there's, um, there's various different channels we can hopefully share that information through. And as well, Oriel said, the recording of this session will be up in the next week or so as well, once that's been transcribed and translated and that sort of thing. So you will all receive um, the recording to that as well. Great. Um, thank you very much indeed, everybody, for coming this afternoon. Um, I am sure we're only at the beginning of learning to make sense of, of the last year, and there's going to be plenty more needing, uh, needing to be done as we go, as we go through this together. Um, it's been a fascinating conversation. I can see all sorts of threads that I want to, I want to pull on. So thank you very much, Ian, and louise Todd, and Dave. And thank you to all of you, too, who've stayed the course uh, for an hour and a half on Zoom. Look forward to seeing you for the next one. Ciao and